Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kristen, Kristen Mills. I'm the Visual Arts Program Manager at the Vermont Studio Center. And now I will read uh, George Perlman's bio that he gave to us. Um, it is in the first person, so I'm gonna read it as if I'm George, okay? Is that okay with you, George? It's okay with me. I have been a painter all my life. I've maintained a studio practice and have shown regularly at galleries in New York City and Vermont and many group shows in the US and internationally. I studied at Parsons School of Design and Pratt Institute and did my master's at Brooklyn College. While at Pratt, I met James, how do you pronounce it? Gahagan. Gahagan, who was a longtime student and a studio assistant to Hans Hoffman. Jim introduced me to the teachings of Hoffman as well as other Hoffman students. It was my mentor and friend for over 30 years. In 1985, I became part of the administration at the Vermont Studio Center. Over the last 30 years, I've had the opportunity to meet and work with amazing artists from every corner of the world. I love that. Uh, and then George, I'm gonna pull up the images and the floor is yours. Okay, great. Welcome everybody, whoever's there. Oh, of course we go through the slideshow, huh? Um, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna actually just go through these and George can start talking. And once we hit one of okay. the actual paintings, then you can, okay. This, this is a view of the gallery, um, of the Red Mill Gallery. Kristen went in and took some beautiful shots today. That's George's house. <laughs> in the background is my house, yes, that's right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm very pleased with the way the show looks in this gallery space. I just put up seven paintings. So, uh, and that was really the juxta of the last couple of years actually, so. Uh, I spent the last couple of years working on these seven paintings. So. And, uh, that's the front of the Red Mill Gallery for anyone that doesn't know it. Uh, mm -hmm. Ah, here we are. This is uh, this is one of my first. This is one of the paintings I did over the last couple of years. And really, before I start, I just want to explain what these paintings are all about. There's a there's been something called visual plasticity. And what this is, and artists have dealt with this forever, is how do, how do we see three things in three dimensions and interpret that into a painting which is two dimensional? So that, that's always the premise of any painting, actually. Um, how do you transcribe a three dimensional image into two dimensional? And the way, I, and the way I've been taught is by using the picture plane and um, using color and composition to, uh, to create the space. Um, the three dimensionality, it, it, it's, it's set up in the rhythms. If you look at this painting and you pick any axis, any, it's all planar, they're all overlapping. And you gotta say, where am I in relationship to this part of the painting? So as the eye moves, it moves from one diagonal to the same diagonal above and you'll see that's a movement and an interval that creates a spatial movement. So the eye, when the eye moves, um, it, it gives you that movement in space or out of space. But the trick is it's got to stay flat. In other words, we create all these spaces, but the picture plane, which is the surface of the picture, has to stay um, two dimensional, flat. So you're creating a sense of space of three dimensionality are two dimensional. Now, this all came about, you know, in the late 1800s with uh, science doing studies and, and artists doing <laughs> studying nature. Um, first, the Impressionists, and, and then later on, Cezanne, and they got into the color and the composition and how, how the picture is created. Now, that was, that was new, that wasn't anything new, they just formulated it. Um, forever, uh, this type of painting has been going on from primitive man to uh, oceanic to African art. It all has this, th this same uh, feeling about the space and how the space is looked at. And the, the main thing is keeping that two dimensionality of the space on the picture plane, but giving, giving the feeling of three dimensionality. Let's go on to the next thing. This one's interesting because this one actually was a painting that Andrea started. <laughs> this was, uh, this is a little bit out of my, my uh, palette, let's say. The yellow and blacks and, and that red, which was a quinacridone red, 
was something I hadn't ever used, but she had started this painting, was going to destroy it or take it off the canvas, off the stretchers. And I said, no, that's a nice linen canvas. I'll work on that. And it was fun. I went back into it and uh, set up my, George on it, really. So I call it Andrea George because uh, <laughs> it, it really is my painting now, but it was, it was her painting. Um, but uh, here again, you could see the rhythms that are set up, even in the circles. Now I used to paint, these circles were part of her composition, but I used to paint circles as well before I got into this more uh, angular or rectilinear stuff. Um, but here again, if you look at the, if you just look at, let's say the yellow in the painting and you could sense where the yellows are in relationship. So when the upper yellow comes out, that little yellow at the bottom kind of goes in deep. But as you're looking at the little yellow at the bottom and you can kind of think of it as come forward, other yellows will go back. So that'll happen in similarity of color, but it also has, happens in similarity to shape. So the eye moves not only to the, to the different angles on the planes, but also through the color relationships. And also uh, a, red next to, um, a red next to blue is a different spatial relationship than a red next to the uh, black or a red next to uh, a deep blue or a dark blue or a yellow yet. So every time you get, you get the different kind of spatial relationships that happen with the color, as well as with the composition. Together, they kind of orchestrate, you know, the picture. Mm -hmm. It's a lot like music. There's, there's intervals, there's counterpoint, there's uh, all, all the same types of, you know, Kandinsky and uh, Clay, they all talked about music in their work, you know. For, mm -hmm. for this, this plasticity is actually the cornerstone of the whole modernist movement. When, when modernism, you know, it, from, you know, from, like I said earlier, from the Impressionists to the Cubists and, and on, they all worked off of this theory of uh, plasticity, which was trying to create this space um, that is two dimensional yet expresses a three dimensionality. Next. Uh, this one here was derived from a, a um, what was it? I forget what it was. It was a it was a painting of a, of a female. The, the upper right hand corner was actually the head, and everything else was like drapery coming down. It was, um, and so I took that kind of composition and worked it out myself, and and became very cubist. This is this is probably one of the more cubist paintings. But if you, if you look at the space, each of those each of those cubes are actually reacting to the cube next to it, which creates which creates a form. And then that form is, you know, that form is like sculptural form to me. I feel it like, like a sculpture and it changes because as the space changes, the form changes, uh, but it is a three dimensional form. And as they, let me see what they say. There, there are certain sayings that, I, that I, I've heard growing, you know, going through my mentorship with Jim and stuff that he would use. Um, like, um, oh yeah, planes in a rhythmical motion create volume and volumes in a rhythm create form. And in the form is where the feeling is. So when you get, a, you get planes and there's rhythm set up within the planes, it creates a, a volume. And when those volumes interact with each other, they create a form like a figure or something. And the, the, the whole canvas is that form. It's like a sculptural piece. And in there is where the, where the uh, expression really lies. Next. Uh, this one is, called, this one's interesting. This one's called flight. And what, <laughs> I, it was like a flight of stairs, or it was also that I keep seeing these, bir these birds in this one. I, I don't know if anybody else sees a bird, but um, there's, a, there's kind of a flight, sideways bird, the more vertical head of the bird. That little yellow top and the blue on the right are the two kind of heads, and so I and it just it just brought that feeling of flight to me anyway, and it, and also everybody says it's like the flight of stairs, but here again it's the rhythms of those motions that create the space, and also the color because like that light yellow against the deep yellow creates a certain tension and a certain sense of space, and it, it moves forward or back, it, and just like that red coming down. That red is part of the red above, so it becomes a bigger volume 
and, and the space will move accordingly. So you picture, figure out where you are in the space and then you could kind of say, okay, what happens if my eye is down here? What happens to the space? Or what if my eye moves up here? And as the eye moves, the kind of space kind of, it becomes plastic. That's where the word comes from. It's, it, it mod you think of a, a, a balloon full of air. And if you press any part of that balloon, the, the, the air is gonna pop out somewhere else. Well, that's how a plastic paint, that's how the surface of the picture plane works. If you push in, it comes out. That's where you get the push and pull of Hoffman from. It's that movement in, into space, which creates a counter movement out of space. For every movement, there's a counter movement. But this, this painting was a lot of fun. But, uh, and also with these, with these squares that are on their, on their, on their diagonals, um, they tend to want to go back into space and stack. It's kind of like a, a weird perspective. So I'm constantly trying to bring them up to the surface. So that diamond shape, I'm trying to get it to sit on its bottom and have the top come out at times. Because I don't want them to go back. I want them to sit right up front. So like the top one, if you see that it's, it's surrounded by blue, and then I have that, that little uh, orange yellow diamond in the, mid, in the lower section of it. And that kind of pushes it back. That kind of pushes it in so that top can flow up. And the same thing with the ones below. They're constantly always trying to push that bottom in so they'll stand vertical. It's, it's a, something that's part of my work. That's what I do. <laughs> I, I, I'm really into those, those shapes, those types of, those movements. All right, ah, this one. Yeah, this one, this one was, uh, yeah. The, um, this one was Queen's, I think I called this Queen's Gambit because it was like the queen and then all these knights and I could see all these things happen. But here again, it's, the, it's really about the color and how the color intensity. Um, that yellow um, on the upper left-hand corner, um, it's a little bit different actually than that yellow, but that, that comes so forward. I mean, it really wants, yellow is a color that'll just pop off the picture plane, you know, it'll come right at you. And if you notice, it'll even push that red, which sits right on top of it, pushes it back. So the red almost looks like a negative box going into the, that yellow. But then when you come down against the white, white is the one color that can actually hold off the yellow, the intensity of the yellow. So it won't, it, it needs that in order to set the painting back. Otherwise the yellow will take over and you'll never have, the yellow will never recede, but white, in, and that situation does it. That white, little white diamond there uh, helps to push, push that part of the painting back or push that yellow back. But here again, it's those, it's, it's those movements. It's the relationship of, of those planes and how they move in the space that creates the space for me. The, uh, here, the, the, the vertical in this is kind of interesting because th that has a separate rhythm. And it also, the vertical and horizontals always relate to the exterior of the canvas, you know. That's the first, when I start a can when I start a painting, everything is bouncing off those four sides. And so that, that all plays along with it. But if you follow any of the axes, like what I call the axes is diagonal, the degree of that diagonal, and there, it's repeated. And as you do that, well, for me, my eye moves around and I really get into the painting. I could sit and look at these paintings for a, a long, long time because I, that, that's what I do. <laughs> Next, yeah, okay. This one was in interesting. This, this one is, for all of you know, is the, the Pearl Street Bridge. So the lower left-hand corner of that diagonal gray is actually the bridge itself. And I'm looking out, out, out at the, uh, the red mill on the left and the, the woolen mill on the right and the ponds and the, the falls in front and then back Chesma, uh, Barbara White. But um, here again, this is, this is one of two paintings I did with, uh, with you know, from memory of, of the, the local landscape. So it's landscape based. It's kind of like, uh, like a jazz piece, but relating to something 
you know, that, that everybody's kind of familiar with. So it was, for me, it was like recreating that space the way I feel about it with the right hand side and left hand. So the, here again, I got those diagonals so that it moves in and out of space. But this is, uh, yeah, this is the, the view from the bridge on the Pearl Street Bridge. And uh, yeah, that it was, it's it, doing a, uh, a landscape or, or something that's derived from nature uh, is a limitation to some extent because of the color and you want to play. So it isn't as, it isn't as freeing as, but it is, it is, um, it is, it is, it is fun and it is, um, you, it is expressive. You could totally express, but it's, but it, it does have this limitation. Yeah, that diamond, that blue diamond in the middle, uh, yeah, that, that, you know, trying to get that to sink in and, and, uh, and not, not just come flying off the surface was, was a challenge. But then again, it's in relation to, to those other dark blues. Okay. Uh, here's another, another landscape. Um, this one uh, was from my studio window. And if you see this, this dark blue shape in the, in, in the right in the front there going back um, almost a perspective is the Pearl Street Bridge. And on the right is kind of the railing. But this was during the winter. So the white next to it was actually, the river was covered with snow and there was an opening in the snow, which is that blue. And on the left-hand side is actually the Red Mill. And above that is the uh, Masonic Temple clock tower. So that was kind of the composition. And then I played along with that to try to get into the space. Yeah. And here again, a lot of it has to do with the color, even though the color is low, you know, like that, the, I can't, too bad I can't show you on this. Oh, here, can you see that? No, okay. On, on, those, on those rectangles, like that blue one up in the, in the upper right, uh, you can see how the modulation of the color gives it depth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, you know, it, it changes as you're coming down and it gets lighter and it kind of sets up at that kind of that it pushes that lower part of that plane back. So there's that kind of motion with, within the color Is that, that, that might be it, huh? As far as paintings go. But we can do it again. <laughs> I can, any, uh, any questions? I can go through them if people we want to ask questions, yeah. I, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so um, I love that you spoke, especially from the, the Pearl Street Bridge one and this one, um, that they, they're abstract but they're also referential to right. Red Mill, to the landscape, to the, um, can you talk a little bit about your surface variation? Um, because that also seems like you're talking about, um, so in this sort of plastic language, it seems like you're also talking about transitions of light. And I'm wondering how often you're thinking referentially with that or um, it depends on the painting, I suppose. Well, or just I, if you could talk about your surfaces a little bit because you yeah. have variation. By surface, do you mean texture and brush the Texture or? and the, it, you might be varying value. Sometimes you're varying uh, color intensity. Well, yeah, um, it, yeah. generally I'm, I'm, I'm more concerned about you know, the, co the color interaction, relationship yeah. with the color. So, yeah. and the brush stroke does it, it enhance the color, you know, it brings it up. Like if, if I'm having a problem with something not coming forward, let's say, okay, and, um, and is in the plane, I can give that a thicker piece of paint at the top, an actual physicality that'll help make that 
transition. You know, it'll be yes. it'll be tactile. It'll 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 give off more light. Actually, is what it does. Um, it gives it gives more light. So if you if you put more brush strokes in, it'll give more light. It'll come off of that part of the, the painting or that part. So that it'll help help solve that problem. So it's mostly for problem. you a spatial locator. What's like that? it recalls the picture plane. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. So you're you're using it more to um, recall the picture plane. So you're you're mostly right. interested in those surface variations. Yeah, if you look at the if you look at the this one and you look at the 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 gray mill on the right. Yeah. You know, it, it's creating that light, which gives me depth of depth of that volume. You know, that that plane has depth in it because of the that chiaroscuro. And, and the light that's in there, you know, yeah. and right on the edge. Yeah. So that awesome. something like that will will affect that. And you see in this in the blacks, they're modulated as well. And so are the blues. It's always sometimes in more the more color paintings, I actually bring other colors in and help modulate the edge with a different color. Like I'll bring a, a you know, a, a blue into a purple on the edge, which will, which will change the relationship of the edge next to it. So it's a you know blue purple blue, uh, red rather than a blue red, mm -hmm. and that that'll give you a different spatial relationship because when one color gets next against another, uh, you know the red acts differently against the blue than it does against the yellow. It acts differently against a purple than you know, and there's a green or or something. So all that sets up a spatial dichotomy. Yeah, and uh, you play that against. Against the against the composition, and uh, what what amazes me about visual plasticity is it's it's really not taught. You know, it was it was it was the it was the it was the uh, cornerstone of modernist movement. But if you go to a college, university, and study painting, you don't hear about it, which is really strange. <laughs> Do you agree? I don't know. But uh, I, don't know. I, I talk about it, but I feel old fashioned. Yeah, well, I don't know why, yeah, it, but you know, I'll tell you something about uh, plastic painting. It's the only two-dimensional artwork. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they say pain, painting is dead, but painting can't be dead because there's no other art art form that functions in two dimensions. Everything else is, has, is linear, has time involved. Painting, you can look at it and boom, you instantly see the painting. It's the only art form that functions that way. And then the time element is the space element in the painting. But painting is the only, you know, plastic painting is the only um, art form that functions in two, in two dimensions. Which is, uh, so it's not going anywhere because it's the only one that does it. So. <laughs> but, uh, but, but getting back to that, I, thought, I always thought it's very strange that, uh, that in um, art school, you don't, you know, even when you study art history and you study about the movements, they don't really talk that much about, about the theory, you know, the, the theory of uh, plasticity, you know, everybody wrote on it, you know, Kandinsky wrote, Paul Clay wrote, I mean, all the artists at the time wrote about, you know, um, wrote a lot about it, you know, and um, you, uh, you can read all kinds of stuff that's written about it from that period. But then it kind of went away and uh, it's not talked about, it's not written about. But for me, it's really what it is. When I look at a Picasso or something, that's how I, I see it this, this way. And it really creates you know, a, a real impression, uh, an expression actually. Um, so any of those works that, are, that function this way uh, are really am amazing, amazing, amazing for me to look at and, and study because I could see that I could see their space. I could see the, see the space within it. Maybe you could write about it, George. And that, you know, that's not me. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, there have been plenty written. That I don't need to because. Uh, right, everybody's... but what about contemporarily? It's not being written about. Right? No, no, it's not. Mm. It's really not. There's there's lots of other art forms that, but not this art form. Or collaborate with a writer. Yeah, Gary Clark. <laughs> Yes. I'm here, George. I'm I'm listening in for sure. <laughs> <clears throat> no, it's it, you know it really you know I was very fortunate to have studied with Jim Gahagan, um, and uh, you know he, he taught me, and then I spent the next fifty years 
doing this stuff and, and learning through doing and uh, and work, working through all the problems. Mm. And, um, you know, it, it's, um, yeah, it's, it, it's not easy, but it's very fulfilling. When I finish a painting, it, it's very fulfilling. These paintings take a long time. And, um, but they, uh, yeah, they're there. They were, you know, it is fulfilling. Uh, it was great to see the work up at the Red Mill Gallery. And, you know, I'm, I'm only right across the street, so uh, across, not even across the street, next door, mm -hmm. but it's great just to see the work out of the studio and up on the walls and you can look at it from the street and uh, that's great. I have a question about that. Um, yeah. Like when I walked in, well, I've walked in a few times, obviously, but um, I didn't know if they were hung because I wasn't there for the install, but I wasn't sure if they were hung in a way to have a conversation with each other or like to bounce off of each other. No. Interesting. Yeah. It, it is a problem with these paintings. And I found that true, with especially these high intensity color paintings. You know, they'll start bouncing off each other. So I try to give them as much room. If you notice, there's, there's room around each one, like there's one on that wall, and, you know, because that ha I don't really want it to happen. It happens. I mean, you can't avoid it. But they start to bounce, just like the color in the painting starts to bounce. Like I go from one color to the other, and that's how I create, sp you know, create space in the painting. Well, one painting will start talking, you're doing that to another painting, which is kind of yeah. weird. That's why I like to leave enough space around them. That hopefully, you can focus on the one without having to deal with that. I like that they bounce around. I'm sorry that it's a problem for you. No, it's not a problem. It's actually another phenomenon. It's not, you know, it's not. Yeah, it's not it is different. a phenomenon. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it's yeah. very active and dynamic in that way. Yeah. So it does, it does, definitely does happen. And, and I thought about it before I put these in. I purposely put these in this order because mm -hmm. of the way they look next to each other. I didn't want to put another yellow one next to this yellow one. I didn't, you know, if I put it the other side of the room and I didn't want to put the two landscapes together mm -hmm. like that. Right. But uh, I, I, think it, I think it looked good in that space. Yeah. Just the right size. So I have another question about your um, edges mm -hmm. and yeah. um, if they're all taped and yeah. and some hand hand cut in like a house painter um, or all done one way because I don't know if you noticed that yeah. the hand drawn in the hand painted in one has a different spatial cue than the taped yeah, edge. Does. Do you ever play with that? Um, I know I'm I'm really into the exactness. So I do use tape, but you know, these things change so much that it, you know, it, it's, when I start off, they're much, they're very loose. Mm -hmm. they're, they're just like, you know, amorphic. They're, there's no hard edge really when I start off sometimes and then things develop and I don't predetermine anything. You know, this, they're, like I'm not sitting here drawing this out like a composition. This all happens on the canvas through the movement of the planes. And it's weird, the geometry sets in, but that, that comes over time, but that is not thought of in advance of ge geometric, it just comes out. The geometrics come out as the space gets developed. All right. It, it's really, it is, um, it's very, it's a strange phenomenon. And, uh, but some people think, oh, I sit down and I draw these out and then I, I paint them and it's not like that at all. It's, it's constantly changing. So these paintings are quite thick and they take a long time because they're constantly changing. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, there it is, the Pearl Street Bridge. <laughs> I just want to see what they look like if I went really fast. Yeah, they have blink. <laughs> Hey, George, I have a question. Oh, Kathy, hi. <laughs> the show looks great. And thanks for talking about your work. Um, I'm just really shocked, like the difference, mm -hmm. the way the paintings look when I see them projected and you talk about them and how they look when I see them sort of looking into the gallery, particularly like that very first one on the left, um, 
with all the white in it. The landscape, yeah. The Pearl that, Tree Bridge uh, one. That first one, it's just like um, the white just has this like whole conversation with itself that I think when I see it up close, I don't see. And I wonder if you have a hard time like knowing when the painting is done because mm. there's such a variety of experience, whether you're like sitting still with it for a long time or coming across it and seeing it um, more um, sort of as a new experience. How do you know when you're done? Yeah, it's, it's, it's strange. Um, I spend a lot of time on these, but, but it, is, it, is, it is a fact I know when they're done. They, they just all come, it comes together. And, you know, I don't, I never change it. When it hits that spot, I really never hardly ever change them. Um, you know, I spend a lot of time with them. So it's not like I'm just done and then, but you know, I'm constantly, but then all of a sudden it's done. And I put it, I kind of put it away. I work on a couple, usually have a couple of paintings going at the same time because they take so long and because it's wet, it's oil paint and, uh, and, but, um, but yeah, I, it, it, it is like when everything just jives, when, when the gestalt gets set up and the total gestalt, then you know it's, it's done mm -hmm. because every, every part is part of it and every part's in its right place. And that's really the, the way I work. So are you surprised by them, you know, like later when you see them again, like do they do things that you didn't expect or didn't? Um, sometimes, yeah, like just today actually with this, uh, one of these, I think the paint, this third one in, um, yeah, I looked at it and I saw a thing I, ha I hadn't really seen. I saw a rhythm that, mm -hmm. uh, and that, that I hadn't seen before. And then all of a sudden, you know, my eye caught it and I started getting into the painting. But uh, no, I, I enjoy having them around there. I, I have all the paintings and they're, you know, for years. And, but um, I enjoy looking at them and, um, but I do know when I do know when they're done, and I have no urge to go back into them and anymore. I think when I was, I think as a younger painter, it was different. But now I think I I've reached the point where I know when it's done. Great, thanks, George. Yeah, thanks for the question. I'll, I'm going to stop the screen share if that's okay. Okay. And then you can look at people's faces. <laughs> Is that good? Well, look at you're in sunlight. George. Hey, Annie. You've got a Patronus. I have a question. I if I'm unmuted. Yes. Um. So, why did do you pick like the shapes you do? Is it trying to just make the plane as active as you can, or is there like uh, more emotional reasons, or you know, is it just purely to make it as plastic as possible? The the shapes, the angles, the circles versus squares, or is there more to that? What that that they're that they're so defined as shapes like that? You mean the uh... like like is are you choosing um, aesthetically sh shape these shapes as a means to the end of this is how you think could make the most active surface of a painting, or is there a, an emotional connection to this look? Okay. Yeah, no, there's a motion, there's a, there's a connection, emotional connection, a feeling for the dynamics of the form. So I could feel that form that the painting is creating. And if it's off anyway, I could feel that. And so it's, it, that, it's that that makes the change. But like I said, it's, there's a really weird ge geometry, which I'm not into geometry, but there's a weird geometry that keeps coming in. Things end at the same place. Pl planes all end on a certain plane. It's, it's, it's really strange, but it, I don't go that route as far as thinking about that. I'm going more into the feeling of the, of the space. So, and, but that, that the geometry comes out. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Do you want me to show George's work again? I think Preacher just find us. I feel like I should see the work. Just one more time. Seven out of a lifetime of painting. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. I haven't been very productive in the last couple of years, you know. So this is seven seven works. Here, I'll go through again. This is George this morning. That was yeah. <laughs> I caught him thinking about his work in his studio before I took pictures. I was trying to figure out what studio that was actually. You uh -huh. went to the Red Mill or 
which of the uh, where I was painting at that time it was probably in the little barn uh, next to John's. Oh, okay. I'll just go through these one more time. Hey, hey George, this is Gary. Yeah, yeah. I was just wondering about the the one with George and Andrew with the, that had some circles in it. Um, yeah. Were the circles from Andrea or were those? They were, Gary. A blast uh, you know, I used to paint circles. I know, that's what I mean. <laughs> yeah, but she, she has, and, and with her, it's like more of a gestural circle than a hard, real hard circle, you know? Mm -hmm. But I made them my circles. Yeah. And, um, well, it was kind of fun because it was sort of like a, a sort of tipping of the hat to some paintings I've seen of yours, you know, a long time right. ago. It was yeah. fun to see those circles and I was wondering where they'd come from, so. Yeah, that. Yeah, they came in this situation. They came from her, uh, uh -huh. from her painting. But um, but yeah, th this painting has a, a, a lot of space. I think it has a lot of depth in it. You know, mm. that that lower center, that lower left, really, and then it goes out. And and the circle has a sense of volume that that a rectangle or a diagonal doesn't. Have. Circles expand and they and. Mm -hmm. um, you could just have a gesture of a circle like that right right hand circle on the upper right corner where I just do that curve, but it has a sense of that big circle because it implies that big space. So uh -huh. there's certain yeah. things that, you know, those gestures of the circle will imply even if they are, aren't on the surface. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, and then it's, it's, it's the integration. Well, all a circle is, is, is more, I look at a circle as multiple planes, like the edge of, you know, it's, it's that constant changing of a plane. Like sometimes I'll even play that into the painting where it'll look like a circle, but it's actually just a bunch of different angles that make up that mm -hmm. circle. Mm -hmm. And then I play them off a hard edge somewhere else, which is the same axis. Yeah, but... Um, it's like if you, if you if you look at that right hand circle on the right upper right hand corner, uh, in relationship to the the center red, and and feel like which which is which is more out of which, what happens when I go into that red in the center? Does that red on the upper right hand corner come out? Is that is there that kind of a movement? So that's the type of that's one movement of that. <laughs> and that that red that that was Andrea's quinacridone, which is that purple, red. I'm used to using more of that cadmium. So. Mm. What's the name of this one, Dad? I didn't come on. You want to name it? I don't have a name for it. <laughs> this one, I, I, think, I think it was the only one I didn't name. I don't know why. I just didn't. I'm getting cave. I'm getting cave like. Cave? Something cave. Hmm. Think on it. Plato's cave. There's something about that ochre. I don't know. Just... Sure. Oh. This one's interesting because I did use the ochre, and the ochre, you know, the relationship of an ochre to a blue and an ochre to a yellow. Really sets off that those uh, the spatial planal things because you know ochre is such as like a middle road color and you can go any direction with it. I like the ochre a lot. Anyone else? I do love how these change, or I change. <laughs> like the more you sit with them. Yeah, it takes time to, to digest them and sit with them, I find. Uh, and then get into those, <laughs> getting into the eye movements, which are the, the planal movements. And the... Mm -hmm. You really need to live with a George Perlman painting to get the full essence, <laughs> I, I think. You need a lifetime on the wall, huh? space. You don't think all my screen is good enough? <laughs> <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I do think they look good. 
No, no. Uh, I mean, these images are good because you can see a lot of the information, but not like in real life. <laughs> it's just about the time I think you can spend with them. Like. Yeah. Yeah, I think the image reproduced, you know, it, it is fine. I mean, you still get that. I, I still get the same experience. I get that same experience to some extent. You don't get the tactility of the paint right. and all that. And, and of course, the color is off on the screen somewhat compared yeah. to the color in the painting. But to have a good reproduction yeah. of this type of painting is pretty good. Here, here again, it's the change of the temperatures in the green, like this front corner green in relationship to the, the warmer green and the darker greens. And uh, it's all about temp temperature change. And like Kathy said, this one with the whites, I never used to paint a, a lot of away. Of course, this was a winter scene kind of anyway, but. But the white's really, white functions as a color. I mean, it's just like any other color. It's just, it isn't just meant to whiten down other colors. It, it has its own integrity. Mm -hmm. Look at those flowers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the flowers getting to be July, almost. Do you ever paint your flowers? Uh, I'm inspired by them. I know I don't paint them, but sometimes the color comes out in the painting. Well, well thank you, George. That was oh, awesome. Thanks, everybody. It was really great to hear you talk about your work while looking at it. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Yeah. I quite enjoyed the show. Still, I'm enjoying the show. <laughs> um, thanks, yeah. everybody. Yeah. Thanks, George. Okay, Thank guys. You, George. Bye. Yeah, have a good night, George. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for putting this on. This is wonderful. Thank you. Great.